What's going on, everybody? Uh, welcome to today's podcast episode of, of Marketing with Tran and Fabris. I am your co-host, Tom Tran, and along with me is my uh, partner in crime, Kevin Fabris. Uh, and today we have uh, two things that we wanted to really talk about um, throughout the course of this episode, mainly because it comes about in our day-to-day -day life as a uh, marketing agency and as a digital marketer. So the very first thing that we're going to talk about today is the difference between direct response marketing or advertising and branding, right? The nuances of the both, um, what channels are out there, not just digital, and some of our thoughts on that. And then the second part, we wanted to talk a little bit about the mindset of sport or the business of sport, the mindset that we've adopted as an entrepreneur and that we um, share as um, treating business as a sport. So. Circling back um, with the very first thing I wanted to kick off with is the concept of direct response advertising versus branding. Kevin, first question to you. Can you describe to our viewers, just define those two concepts. What is direct response and what is branding? Uh, yeah, sure. So basically direct response for me is something like where you're making one offer for somebody. They see one ad, you make one pitch. You try to get them to immediately exchange their name, email, phone number with you in exchange for, you know, that offer, some return on value. If you're giving them a way to contact, this goes right back to um, like those late night ads on TV, but, but, but wait, there's more. You know, it's literally they put in one concept for you. If you hook, they get a direct response. This is great in certain scenarios, not the best for others. Uh, branding is more like a slower play. In my opinion, most businesses would prefer to use branding because, you know, branding kind of takes advantage of the fact that there's multiple touch points, especially in today's environment. You know, we went from the rule of seven touches to the rule of 50 touches. And that's kind of how long it takes for the branding to kick in. That's where they recognize your type font, you know, uh, your type. That's where they recognize your colors. That's where, you know, they get used to the fact that a video from you looks a certain way. Uh, that is really, really effective for no like trust, you know, uh, direct response is transactional, whereas branding to me is really, you're building followers, you're building fans. Um, you know, with both of those, Tom, I know we both kind of came up with a direct response, but now that we've been in it for a decade, is it one of those that you actually prefer if you're taking on a new client and then also for yourself, how do you do it? And the, the classic answer that you guys are always going to hear on this show, and I think in real life should be, it depends. Yeah. It really should, unfortunately. And mm. I think that's why I wanted to start off by asking you to define what the differences are, right? Mm. Because in a perfect world, if you had an unlimited budget, you'd say, I would say both. I want both, right? And really how it was reminded to me, right, uh, was uh, when we were um, learning from Billie Jean, the, like years ago. Right. And what Billy said was at the very onset, right. He had said, my branding will be a, um, I mean, it will be a, how did he frame it? Essentially Billy, what I learned from Billy was all direct response, right? My background story was I was in uh, residential real estate investing uh, before uh, going into the digital space with, with everything. So uh, my whole motivation for getting into marketing was I needed to level the playing field because my competitors were doing all direct mail right? Direct mail, direct response, direct mail, right? Hey, you have this house. I want to buy it. I'll give you a cash offer. Simply put. And I was like, dang, is there another way that I can get that cheaper than sending out that postcard or that, that uh, yellow envelope with that was handwritten? And that led me to digital, right? So, uh, okay, this is now I remember um, what I was going to say. What Billy had said to me that struck a chord was um, your branding is a byproduct of your direct response. And I was like, let me say that again and unpack that. Right. At first, he had said your branding should be a byproduct of your direct response campaigns. And I was like, that's very interesting because the people that we serve, right, when we were learning from Billy years ago in terms of running Facebook ads are local businesses. Local businesses are not the Coca Cola's of the world. They're not the Nikes of the world. They're not the McDonald's of the world. Well, we know just do it. We know the golden arches. We understand the font type of Coca Cola and the red that they, that they have branded themselves with for years on end, right? So what we have to do is make sure that one, the advertising that we do, it, we can actually prove and 
ROI, a faster, if not an immediate ROI, right? So that 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 small business can maintain profitability and then reinvest into more marketing, right? So direct response in terms of the pros of direct response are going to be um, immediate feedback. Does your offer work? Are you sending it to the right people? The, the pillars of direct response um, that were taught to me um, were from Dan Kennedy, right? And he said the three M's. The three M's of direct response are message, market, media, right? Message, what are you saying? Market, who are you saying it to? Media, how are you getting in front of them, right? And also, right, um, a, a variable that is in both sides of direct response and in branding is the frequency. You had touched on it. We used to live in an age where like a sales, um, I don't know, uh, a, a, a sales law, if you will, right? Fortune is in the follow-up. And if we know that, how many touches on average does it take for, uh, for someone to see our messaging, have interaction with us before they make a buying decision? It used to be seven, then it changed to 14. And now we're at probably 50 because of all of the, of all of the, the different inputs and it, like, you know, different things that are grabbing and, and vying for our attention nowadays, right? So in short, if you're a business that needs direct, that needs a direct in like infusion of ROI for leads, right? I would lean on direct response. Over time though, right? You're going to want to make sure that you're branding yourself so that you can increase, develop and maintain your KLT, your no like, and trust because People do business with people. No matter if you're B2B, B2C, it's all P2P. It's people to people, right? Yeah, and just kind of echoing on what you said there, uh, or what you said that Billy said, mm -hmm. essentially, if you are running multiple uh, lead generation campa campaigns, you know, for, uh, say, a local dentist office, if you, mm -hmm. if you have one going in June, you switch the offer in July, you switch the offer in August, in September, well, you know what, after a while, as long as your ads look the same, you're speaking the same way, you've also worked on your branding. Right. You know? the, the downfall with that is you're also conditioning your audience to know that there's always another offer coming. So it takes away like the, I need to act now because we're going to run out. Oh, there's only 20 seats? Oh, okay. Well, don't worry. It's going to be 20 seats on an offer worth the same thing next month too. Right. right? So there, there's advantages and disadvantages with both. Um, typically what you'll you know, like the, the big problem that we have with kind of uh, direct response ads, especially in a digital space, is there is a high cost up front. Um, meaning like you're going to have to obviously pay for your ad spend, the creative, if you're using an agency, that's there. But there's also the time commitment, right? Uh, on a typical small business, if they get, say, 30 to 100 leads in a month for your you know, carpentry business, debt off any service, you also now have to follow up with all of those businesses. And as much as you can automate, say the, well, you know, you're the guy to talk to on this one, but as much as you can automate the email follow-up and, uh, you know, like the text outreach, the phone outreach, SMS, all of that kind of stuff, you still have to have them in your system and actually put it work. It's not right. just dollars for money, right? And then they get in, they have to like it, all of that kind of stuff. And it is going to be transactional versus branding, it takes longer. It may take you zero dollars to start, you know, because you can just pick up your phone at any point, start doing ads. You know, this isn't costing us very much. Uh, and people are coming out of the woodwork. They're already saying to me, hey, I saw this. I was introduced last week. It's like, oh, this is Kevin with, he has a video podcast. I was like, eh, okay. You know, just not even knowing that people were watching, which is the, the fun of it, right? Mm -hmm. You don't know that people are watching. They definitely are. The response isn't going to come as quickly, but the people that are tuning in every week are getting a little bit more out of it. Every day they're getting a little bit more out of it. So when it is time for them to make that, you know, when it is time for them to decide, okay, I need a little bit of help with this. You know, I need somebody to build my deck. Well, I've seen, I've seen Kevin and Tom talk about decks every week, you know, every day for this certain amount of time. So there is no sale. Like a lot of times when people are used to, you know, before they go into say direct response ads or something, they're used to only getting referrals. Right. Branding campaigns basically are referrals in a way. By the wow. time you show up on that call, this person already knows you. They already like you. They may not trust you fully, but that's what the phone call is, right? Seeing how you actually work with them. Yeah, well said. And just to kind of just take the baton back from you, right? And kind of just continue on with that conversation. Some of the things that you said, um, 
in regards to the differences with branding and with direct response. What I want to kind of set the baseline for, for people that are listening to this is when we talk about those two concepts, we haven't talked about the channels or in other words, like say with direct response, I mentioned the three M's, right? The media. Media, in other words, is just a channel that you want to basically be doing this thing on, right? Direct response literally can be door to door, right? Knocking on a door. Hey, do you want to, I have this. Do you want to buy it? That's direct response, right? They're going to say yes or no. And nowadays they're probably not even open the door, right? Or they're going to talk to you through, through the ring, right? <laughs> when they're on the other side of the door because they're not going to talk to you, right? There's, and But the shift, branding, right? Um, when when Kevin, earlier, when you were mentioning branding, when I first started my business, I, and I still have this mentality in terms of bootstrap mentality, right? Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, most businesses, when you look at, say, your local market, right? If you are a local business, you have you have a defined amount of people, right, within your brick and mortar, if you are a brick and mortar local business, right, that are, that are going to be your potential customers. So oftentimes, mm -hmm. what people do, if they're starting a business in a certain area is they're going to start join the local chamber of commerce, um, they're going to, uh, within the chamber of commerce, there's leads clubs, or there's other networking groups like a BNI, right. So with that, the reason why Kevin was saying it's branding, right, is because what you're doing is you are establishing your no like and trust with other business uh owners in the area and also with uh, with the community because that's the community that you serve right it does take more time it could be more quote unquote profitable if you're not valuing or putting a dollar amount on the time spent to do that right and the other thing i wanted to touch on as well is the concept of lead versus referral because oftentimes with a local business that gets into advertising online for all my advertisers that are listening to this, all my digital marketers, what is the one of the most common objections that you get once you get them leads? My what? These are these are bad leads. <laughs> right, exactly. Because <laughs> what you're expecting is a referral, right? You work a referral differently than you work a lead because the referral had there's a, a transfer of trust somewhere and they're a lot closer to the sale, right? By the time that they're reaching out to you. A lead isn't. And for all the people that have been in local leads clubs, right? Or BNIs when you're supposed to get referrals and not leads, you know what the difference is between a lead and a referral, right? One, I know that a lot of you guys, because I was in one for years and I currently am in a different one, right? Um, when you have to put that little piece of paper in that hat to say that I gave someone so-and-so a referral and you ain't got a referral for them, I know y'all are freaking putting in leads, if anything, okay? So if you think about that conversation, the conversation is different. So the value right? That you have to understand that say you bring in terms of generating more leads is what is the value of a lead if you're not following up with that lead? So when we talk about automation, we're talking about following up or, or talking to that person, right? To have that experience. When you're getting back to a referral, the, tr the trust is already built. When you're not getting back to a lead in that matter of time, there was never any trust to begin with, but you've lost so much op potential to build that trust. And the whole concept in theory is speed to lead, right? If you have to get so it's an astrom astronomical difference between your closing ratio um, if you are responding to a lead within five minutes versus not. I've seen this statistic many a time, and I'm sure we can pull it up later on. But how are you as a local business owner that wears all the hats in your business already going to be able to raise your hand and follow up and start a conversation or continue a conversation with the lead that's expressed interest with you, your business and your service if they've never done business with you before? That's where automation needs to come into your business. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now compared to a few years ago, like the biggest mm -hmm. difference that I see is, you know, when we first started, it was basically the way it was done every single time, even though the business is paying so much money for a campaign, so much money uh, to actually run the ads. Well, who is it that would actually be reaching out to the leads? Right. It's it was not the owner. Always, it's never the owner. It's never the manager it would always be the newest receptionist, you know, or the, the newest person on staff. It was like that college kid, the same way that, you know, in truth, you know, social media campaigns used to be like, oh, my niece, she's in university. So she knows how to use Facebook. Like that's what that was 10 years ago. And then after a while it took, you know, people would see it after it's in place. Like, oh, this isn't, you're not just using Facebook. You're like doing something else. They, they wouldn't even know what it is. Right. Yeah. But because it was always like the lowest person on the totem pole, because nobody actually likes, you know, exposing themselves to rejection, which is basically mm -hmm. what a follow up is, um, you know, it would be a, a lower priority on the list. It would never be within the first five minutes. Uh, and then the people that are there aren't even really solid with 
the whole concept. Right. Automation lets you make sure that you're saying it, you know, in the exact tone that you want every single time with proper branding on, say, your emails, your SMS, providing extra shots of value, like where you should just be saying, you know, a few years ago, it was like, thanks for your interest. We'll reach out to you shortly. You know, now it's like, thanks for your interest. This is what's going to happen next. Oh, and by the way, we've got this extra thing for you right now. If you call us today, that's actually an older move I got from Billy too, but it works very yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, I think it's great. I mean, uh, so those are a lot of things that we've talked about that um, quite frankly, um, happen in, in the field. Right. And these are things that you as a marketer or as a business owner need to think about uh, when you're, if you're interviewing, right, an, an agency, if you're not doing it in-house, if you're interviewing a new member of your team that you want to bring on and kind of task these roles to, right, and make sure that that, that what Kevin said, I want to always want to basically kind of uh, echo that. Don't task the newest employee or intern or family member to one of the most important roles of your business right now, because if there's no attention around your offer and there's no marketing, a, a sale is never going to be made and nothing is going to happen in your business. If sales don't happen sales above all, because without profitability and income in your business or revenue being generated, you can't support any of your staff. You can't pay your bills. And I know inherently everyone knows that, but Understand that there is an actual necessity and there is a chain of events that has to happen. So prioritize your marketing, understand what needs to be done. Ultimately, build your database or your list of customers. If you've been in business for any amount of time, right, uh, you have a list of past clients or customers, uh, leads and people that say didn't take your offer, right? Make sure you're constantly building that because, again, you can leverage that no like, and trust that you've built over the years with them to be able to then remarket to them, right? As in, we have an offer, haven't seen you in a while. Not remarketing in the sense of the digital remarketing things, right? But more so, hey, we've already built a transactional relationship or a business relationship, right? It's going to be a lot easier for you to ask them to buy again or buy something new that you're bringing into your, your business than it is to find a new customer, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and just to kind of echo uh, or maybe kind of pivot a little bit, mm -hmm. um, in terms of like what I prefer to do, we're launching a new product right now. Um, you know, it's our Japanese website offer, right? It's for English schools in Japan. Um, and the reason that I really like that is because, because we have such a niche market and it's essentially, you know, foreigners from like 10 different countries living in Japan. There's an audience of maybe five to 10,000 in the whole country. So it makes it very easy for us to, one, find them through targeting, just based on like languages. Uh, you're an expat, you live here, you speak English, great. You know, so it's a very, very defined audience. So lead generation or like the direct response is very cheap, but also um, branding to them is also very cheap, you know, because it's just essentially put your $5 a day behind a post you can make sure that basically everybody you want to see it as long as they're on social media is going to see it. So it's kind of like that double play it kind of, you know, it kind of uh, echoes like the, the three by three formula, like where sure. you, first you brand it, they watch it and then you send them the offer. But in truth, every time I've ever done that, the direct response works faster anyways. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a more, there's a more sophisticated like uh, math equation that will actually show that <laughs> Yeah, even though I get more clients the first way, the people who come through the funnel the other way stick around longer. They're maybe more likely to to trumpet my brand to work as an ambassador on my behalf. But truthfully, like, you know, anytime I get somebody on the phone, pretty quickly they can understand that we know what we're talking about. You know, you show them a lot of resources. It's that same thing. It's no like trust. It's just how much no like trust are they going to show up with on the initial call? Yeah. How much do they believe me on the initial call? And what about like after that initial call when the buying decision isn't made there and it's the objection of let me think about it or let me talk to you, whatever it is, right? Transaction doesn't happen there, but they're still on the fence because they haven't chosen the right service provider or, or business to help them with that. Whether yeah, so it, it could be anything, right? At that point, a lot of times what they're going to go to, or we'll use it in the sales call, like we'll, we'll just show them all of the different stuff. Like, yeah, you know, you could probably see some of our other clients on our Instagram page, or if you check you out go. these case studies on our website. So like, you're still giving them the brown, the branding to get the social, was it social credit? Proof. Or yeah. Social proof. 
Yeah, social credit is completely different. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, essentially, they work together as much as somebody may just make a transaction based on your direct response. They're only they will make one, right? right? But they're not going to make two, three, four unless you give them a great experience, and that experience is part of your branding, like the 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 opening the box, whatever it's the unboxing, the the great reveal, the fact that it's like, hey, let's get into my system, and then I'm sending you. You can just see that I have everything lined up like a professional. Here's the first email. This is what we need access to. Great. Here's the second one. This is this 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 this. You make it easy, you save yourself a ton of time and it, it feels like an automation, but it is just another form of branding in a way too, right? Because if you're sending it from, you know, from Kevin at gmail.com and it doesn't have the proper format and there's nothing at the bottom, it takes away the, the professionalism at it. You know, like I get 20 emails a day from SEO companies around the world. Hey, we have this da -da 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 organization. We can do your SEO. We can do your digital marketing. Where it's like, well, you're clearly not reading what kind of company I am. It's clearly you just scraped a website. And the fact that you're saying you have this kind of agency and you're hitting me up off of a Hotmail uh, like email address, it takes away from the branding, which is the no like trust. I don't trust your, you have a company that's actually successful if you're sending me that there. And yeah. it just, it is what it is. And I think for local businesses too, the reason why you want to be able to understand how to capitalize on this is because what, of what Kevin said in terms of like, um, both work in tandem. If you're going to lean in and choose direct response because you need leads now, awesome. Great. Okay. Understand though, if the sale doesn't happen, then how is your no like, and trust? What is your no like, and trust plan? I, your branding plan, right? So if that doesn't happen, what do people do, right? Based off of Google's, um, research, the zero moment of truth, right? Oftentimes before someone makes a, a transaction, right? They look at other outlets now more than ever. It is our social proof. What are some examples of social proof or places that they can look, right? Think about all of the different, say, review or testimonial repositories that are out there, like Yelp or like um, the one for attorneys. I forget what it is right now. So that's like, um, but there's one specifically like that for attorneys as well. At least it's here. there's one like that here yeah, in the rate States. Rate my MD, rate my dentist, all of All that those things. Google yeah. reviews are super important. Facebook reviews are there too. And even if you're even like, if you have a pulse on any of these things, right? Mm -hmm. So when people go to Yelp, they're looking at pictures of your food and they're looking at the feedback in terms of your ratings. Same thing on Google. If you have a service-based in industry, you better double down on that because if that doesn't bring you clients or a new business, it could save your business or win that transaction, right? There's one other thing I wanted to talk about when it comes to branding. There's a, have you heard of Dunbar's number? I do not know. Yeah, so if anyone looks, does just research Wikipedia or just goes on Google, Dunbar is D-U-N-B-A-R. Dunbar's number or law of 150, okay? Oh, I know. Yeah, so my point in this to people, right? And I was constantly reminded of this as well as I've been doing more, um, just doing more teaching on, on personal branding is um, it's a theory that states 150 people is the point beyond which members of any social group lose their ability to function effectively. In other words, the Wikipedia definition is this, right? Dunbar's number is suggestive, is suggested cognitive limit to the number of people with whom one can maintain stable social relationships. Meaning your circle, top of mind circle, is going to cap out at 150. Okay. Mm -hmm. Of that 150, are you the number one plumber that they need to that they need to recall in that circle when their toilet gets plugged? Or landscaper or roofer or attorney or realtor. I do not mean for all my realtors out there, right? I do not mean at every single time you see them, you're like, Hey, don't, for, don't forget when you're buying or selling, think of me. I ain't talking about that. Right. But understand that if you're the, 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 if the extreme, cause I always get that objection too. I don't want to be spamming my people, but your people don't even remember you, bro. Mm -hmm. Where's the damn balance, right? You don't have to always be talking about buying my shit. But you can always be adding value. One, And that's why I double down on the whole concept of building an evergreen content library for your business. Because if you have been in business for any given amount of time, I guarantee you, you have a list of at least 10 frequently asked questions. If that's mm -hmm. the case, where is that? How can you not, why should you, why are you not pointing to that? One, if, have you created it yet? If not, create it. Two, right? Once you create it, point people to that. You're going to be adding so much more value because when they do look for your service, right? Who in the hell is going to be top of mind? Who's the one that's been giving them so much value up until the point of where they needed to buy, right? Um, 
Predictable Revenue, another book, right? Mm -hmm. What ends up happening is about 3% of people in any given market, 3% of them are, only 3% of that market is in the buying stage. So that's why cost per click for defense, a DUI attorney, your city is so dang expensive because you're competing against other people uh, that are also competing for that 3% of that market. What about the other 97% of people in that market that you're never talking to? Right. Mm -hmm. Think about that as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That when you, the, the thing that I kind of like that you talked about, uh, as opposed, not, not as opposed to the 3%, but I, I couldn't help but be wondering, like, as you're building out a video campaign for a new client, mm -hmm. that's essentially <clears throat> not a video campaign, like, um, you know, when you're, when you're making short form videos, when you give them the hour and you kind of break it down for them, essentially what you're doing is a branding play that also kind of, uh, it, it is a direct response, but it's not necessarily like you should get it off of every single video. Right. So how do you map it out for them? Is that the frequently asked question model or? Yeah. So if you think about it, it's like what I was, what I always want to do with video is to make sure we're leveraging it right? This is a lever that we should be pulling in your business. Why? Because if you do business with other people, which every single one does, right? Uh, especially in this, in, in when we're talking about local business, right? Um, what is going to say tip the, the scales in your favor? But also, oftentimes, when you're signing up, the reason why people hire agencies is because they don't want to do the work, right? Mm -hmm. But when I say, hey, you should be doing video, you're like, dude, I don't want to do the work, yeah, right? Yeah. But think about the lever that you pull if you did the work, Right. One, most people don't do video because of the fear. I don't want to do it. I think I look all the different, all the limiting beliefs in which, and your mindset as to why you're not doing it. But for the people that get over that hump, the next uh, objection typically is, when the hell do I say? And how do I say it? Right. So mm -hmm. that's where I start with okay, if you were able to hire a sales rep, hire a customer support agent, be able to go on more sales presentations or just talk more about your business and help more people. Right. If you're in the service based business, Right? If your business is service-based, you are helping people. That's how you make money, right? So ultimately, inherently, fundamentally, you are trying to help more people. You can't do that if you have to take one-hour sales calls with people from the moment you wake up to the moment you close the doors and go back home, right? How can you multiply your efforts without having to hire more salespeople and bootstrap? Do that through video, Dude, right? I, I can't help but think about it right now, even as you're mentioning it. Like I know with a lot of service-based industries, the FAQ model works as like an outreach campaign. But mm -hmm. I'm also thinking with like kind of larger clients, like larger established businesses that use direct response at the first step, remarketing with all of the FAQs might be the way to do it. I you know, think so. You're telling the story. Yeah, the email follow-up is this. Hey, how does it work? What's this? Uh, when do I need you? What? Do, how long is the contract? What can I expect? Da, da, da. Those are all things that could basically just be solved in either a paid remarketing, an email campaign. Anything. Uh, and we're talking about when you... It straight up. 100%. And what you're talking about is the deliverability or the distribution model of your messaging, right? So if we think about it from that standpoint, when we establish who that market is, what the message is, right? If the market is local businesses, these people that um, need a certain service and you are that service provider, what are the frequently asked questions? You've done this before. Map that shit out. See, I've, I've said this to people before and my the pushback is always like, well, I just got to get them on the phone. Yeah, 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 just call me and I'll tell you. It's like, yeah, except you're putting it out to a half million people this month. Right. You know, what happens if a thousand people have these questions? And not only are like a thousand people are going to contact you with the questions, a lot of them might just have one of those questions and then you don't follow up with like, they don't see anything else from you. And then you're no longer top of mind. Uh, I was let me buy this pool, but then, you know, I was thinking about the price. I did a little bit of shopping and then uh, I'm gone. You know what? Turns out I'll just go, I'll buy a slip and slide. You think know, about we'll this. So think about the elements that were not working in your favor when we are talking about that, that specific standpoint, right? Levers in terms of leverage, you're not leveraging the fact that you can actually be the person that helps them answer those questions, right? Mm. 24 hours a day, seven days a week through your video. What happens if you're on a phone call with a prospect when there's five other people trying to call you that need what you have right now? In your case, the pool, right? What happens when Dunbar's uh, uh, law, right? The, the, the 150 law kicks in and you ain't that pool guy anymore because they got hit by an ad from someone else. Or they are so, or the neighbor just got a new pool, and they thought about you because you weren't that last person, right? Inbound, or in market audience too, right? 
Yes. And, 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 um, and on top of the in-market audience that you're talking about, right? I want to circle back and have you define that, right? But what happens about this? As you had said, Kev, you said, just put them on the phone with me. So I want to reframe this. If you are actually leveraging what we're talking about in your business, instead of you making calls, what if you had more people calling you saying, I've watched, I've heard, I know, I like, I trust. I want to buy this from you. That's the dream, right? That's, That's the dream, dream, right? That's fans. That's the lay down. They're now referrals, right? They're now referrals. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I, honestly, I from there, that's I think we did a pretty good job on packing that no like trust, uh, how you establish it with with both the direct response versus branding. Mm -hmm. One of those things that um, you know, you kind of do both at all times, anyways. Yeah. Um, but it it serves you to get away from that traditional thought process of branding is Canva. I got Canva. Now everything's cool. It's not that anymore. It's, it's different. It's also the way you talk, the way you dress. It's who you are. All that stuff. Yeah. 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 It really is. Um, but off the top of the show, you were talking about basically how business and sports kind of. Um, Are parallels. Open. Yeah. They're parallels. It's kind of the same thing. Um, I know a hundred percent, you know, like you, if you put in the extra practice to show up your best, you know, you're going to be a better athlete. You know, if you eat right, you're going to perform better. Some reason it didn't necessarily hit me for years, actually for years, uh, that like diet, like diet specifically, I always knew sleep really affected my work performance, but like really like the eating healthy and how that kind of plays into sports. I, I just kind of, you know, I've had a lot of realizations about it in the last little while, but it's going to get old. Of, yeah, yeah, old definitely. Thing. Yeah, it's absolutely. <laughs> <That's fast. laughs> well, why don't you uh, unpack some of those, um, the, the parallels and, and why it seems like no matter what we do, we always come back to this metaphor. Yeah. And I think it's because uh, one of the foundations of our friendship outside of marketing is basketball and sport. Right. Not only are we fans of the game, right, the professional game, but we're players as well. And I think that's really why I have a bias towards player coaches, because they've gone through the trenches, you know, and when I can parallel, say, an ad campaign that didn't work out the gate with my jump shot that didn't work out the gate. But after time, if you're committed to getting better at those two things over time with planning, doing and reviewing and adjusting. Your success is just limited. It's just a matter of time before you actually get that winning campaign or campaigns or angle or hook or offer. Same thing with your jump shot or your step back or your turnaround or your baby hook, right? And I only say that in the sense of, I say that sport, right? It was interesting because I've all, I've, I've, more recently, I've heard the saying like, lean into your weaknesses until you no longer have weaknesses. And I was like, at first, it was a reaction versus a response. And I was like, F that. I can't be perfect at everything. I can't be good at everything. I don't care. I'm only leaning on what I'm good at. Right. But when I started to kind of really dig into that, right, like pain and pleasure, the balance of the two, the necessity to have that balance, right? The yin and the yang, the black and the white, whatever you want to talk about in that sense, right? It's like whenever we're striving for, say, a fit body and mind, it's garbage in, garbage out, good in, good out. It's inputs and outputs, right? So when I think about that contextually, it's like, okay, you and I can run forever physically in terms of like until our, our bodies physically break down. But if we don't think about what we're actually ingesting and eating in terms of our diet and our nutrition, no matter how hard you work out, if you're not eating properly, you're not going to get those results. Same thing on the business standpoint, right? For us, right, we know that the sh one of the shortcuts is by uh, through courses and programs, basically just hiring people in terms of acquiring their hindsight, acquiring their knowledge without having to go through the pain and the agony of all of those, all those L's, right? And that's why I value that because traditionally in terms of how school is teaching us these things, it's so funny that a lot of these schools now, because of like, you know, post pandemic, they're, um, there, more of these schools are offering more of these virtual type of classes, right? Apprenticeships are coming back now. Because in the end of the day, why do we go to traditional school? Why do we go to higher education? Because of the hope and the premise that if we invested in that education, it would give us an ROI. Well, truth be told, our school systems are so outdated now to where you're stuck with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt because of the rising cost of education. But you can't even go out into the workforce uh, 
and then be able to ROI on that education anymore because the skill set that you learn is preparing you for a world that no longer exists. Yeah, I'm going to tell my kids, unless you want to go to school for a profession where like the course name has that, you want to be a nurse, go to nursing school. That right. makes sense to me, right? right? No problem. I'll pay for right. that. But like a specialist, right? Yeah, but I did political science. Yeah, even I did business and business is, you know, I learned stuff, but it was really just kind of broad. And truthfully, <laughs> I was there to go to school because that's what I'm supposed to do in that part of my life. You know, it was just kind of broad. I, like, I got four brothers that are electricians. For some reason, that message didn't register with me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it just, it was what it was. You know, I was, I was probably the best in class, but you know, like in practicality, like, you know, these guys came out of, you know, came out the gate working at 20 and, and you know, it, it was kind of, they solved a lot of their own issues right off the top, just because they went to electrical school to become right. an electrician. That is, Absolutely. It's a laid out path. Um, to kind of circle around though, yeah. one of the things that I think really, really resonates with sports and business is when I was in high school, you know, like I was, uh, you know, I was just like an average high school player, you know, was it wasn't crazy, wasn't awesome, wasn't terrible. Um, but then when I went to college and university, we started playing with some guys, or, or even when we went to provincial finals, I remember uh, there was Jamal McClure, who used to be an NBA all star, he was in the the same squad as us essentially right and then you just get there and dude it was so undeniable that he was just like a different creature you, you know what i mean like it's just like the oh oh it's like i'm a small business and you're coca-cola well this isn't gonna work you know he was right, right. dude he was blocking people with one hand on the ground and one hand in the air like literally touching the ground and <laughs> punting people across the room you know, and that's kind of what sports does the same way that business does. Like when you see somebody performing at such a high level, everybody else just falls in line. It is right. what it is. You know, really well, we can all show up at a court and in 10 minutes, not even in two minutes, you can say yeah. line up in order of good to bad. And that list is going to be about the same, but everybody might place themselves two steps higher than, than everybody else places them mm -hmm. or lower, you know, depending generally with basketball, you, you, you go up, you know, you get a little bit out of swag. Business is kind of the same thing. You know, you show up at that conference and then you hear, you know, this person talk versus this person. Everybody's in the room and you kind of lay out your resume through the, the introductions or, you know, just this guy knows this guy, that kind of thing. And within five, 10 minutes, if you had to say who in this room has the most money, you could probably line up the, the people in a certain order and be pretty correct because it's kind of undeniable. Yeah, because it's branding. I don't know if it's branding. I don't know if we're circling back, but it, it is just that thing. Like, you know, it's evident that you put in the time, you put in the reps, you put in everything to get to that level of accomplishment. You know, I'm going to add to that. It's focused education and time and focusing on a specific craft or knowledge. And as you had said, right, when it's what you said to me at the uh, what you had just said right now towards the end of your comment was about the whole money thing. Right. Because. Mm -hmm. It's been argued, right? You think about it from an extreme socialist or communist. I was a political science major too, right? So uh, like if you think about it from like a socialist or a communist Earning perspective. Money, right? Yeah, right. So much money in that. That's why we're doing it right now, right guys? <laughs> but <laughs> you think about the, the the ideology of it, right? Everything is equal. Everything is shared amongst everybody, right? Well, if you think about that in, in our society, right? If you are not armed with financial literacy, understanding how to make, keep, earn money efficiently, right? And leverage that, right? What happens is if we were to give everyone the same amount of money over time, it's going to just skew back to the way it was because we're not armed with the same education, right? Mm -hmm. I am not knocking education. I'm knocking the system, right? And circling back to what you were saying too, I want to give my girls the opportunity to go and experience what my wife and I were able to experience and go to college and do that. Not for the sake of the anticipation or expectation that they're going to decide on a major and have that be their life's work. No, no, no. I know that reality is that ship sailed even when we were in school still. But I want to give them that opportunity because the networking, the people, we understand this. There's power in proximity, right? Those things and that experience is is something that I want them to have the option to be able to choose to do or not, right? Um, but that's that goes back to what we were saying. Like, how do we like before before Chat GPT and AI and all this stuff that, and this informational age, right? Um, learn like. Like, like what Billy says, right? Like books were the cheat codes to life, 
But what's better than the book is the author sitting right next to you and telling you what he did and what you should do now. And even faster than that, how can you condense time frames even more and be more efficient? If a freaking language model can pass the bar and the freaking, you know, and, and grad school, business school, why not understand how to utilize that to your careers to give you a, a, an edge in your career and in your life, right? That's where we're at today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just how do you use the tool? It's the same thing, you know. Um, it kind of takes it back, you know, in, in my head, athleticism, you know, like when you play ball, there's always like that guy who's just the biggest or the fastest or the strongest, you know, like where it's like no matter what, especially, you know, as a guy who's not a giant or something, like no matter what, I'm playing a guy who's six six, he's gonna have a real that. advantage. Yeah, a real advantage. He's gotta be terrible not to exploit that advantage over me like to right. be i'm five nine right like it just it is what it is that's the same way in business too though like some guys are just showing up maybe a little bit sharper or mm -hmm. like maybe their parents just kind of taught them how this works a little bit better you know the schooling is a little bit there uh i'm sure you've seen it with some clients who are launching you know their first campaign or just launching a business if they're coming from a situation where they already had success they just approach it differently. You know what I mean? They know yeah. they're looking at it. And I see it with athletes too. You know, guys who played a real high level hockey. I have one client who's like that, played a really high level of hockey. And the way that he just, and he also achieved a lot in business too. And the way that he launches his new business, like he just moves different, right? It's, he knows the work that's going to be in there. He's thought about the angles. You know, he basically started before it was perfect but he's he's kind of executed everything and he, he solved a lot of the questions before he even did any you know what i mean and that's a great segue right into starting before it's perfect because perfectionism as i've learned begrudgingly over these past this past decade as an entrepreneur um is just another excuse for procrastination it's another it's another word for procrastination right? Do not wait until it's perfect to do something. Learn along the way. Like the book, right? Uh, you can't learn how to ride a bike in, at a seminar. Yeah. Right? You can't. You're not going to perfect your jumper uh, by going to a workshop and just sitting there and then looking at someone or watching tape on YouTube, right? You need to adjust, but you also have to go out there and do. And that was one of the uh, the most valuable things in terms of the ideation and the actual implementation of what we're calling this podcast right now. We knew, we knew, this is what we knew to be true. Video is leverage. We know our stuff. We need to ha have more conversations with business owners. How are we going to do that? Especially because Kevin and I, you and I were already committed to meeting every week because of the value that, that our relationship and our, and our conversations brought to the table. But we were like, why be selfish with this? Why not share this stuff so we can get more leverage in our business? And also, it would just be fun to hang out with, with, with a friend and be talking about this in a channel that we know we want to, in the long term, leverage in our businesses anyways. So with that being said, we fumble around. If you're watching this episode, watch this episode and watch the first one. Yeah. And just, I'm excited to see where, episode, where, where the next, say, dozen episodes goes and basically levels up to, you know? Mm hmm absolutely and and that's one of those things that yeah we um like we're fairly hard any anybody who makes stuff that goes out to a ton of people or, or most people anyways are pretty critical of it just because we're saying to do it as opposed to make sure it's perfect before you put it out doesn't mean that i don't look back at it and be like ah there's a shadow on the wall behind me the whole time and oh this wasn't dialed in the right way but that being said like you you know, we don't know how to get past those problems until we kind of identify them, see how big they are, and then just figure out solutions. But otherwise, you know, if we were, you know, stuck on the fact that my camera sucks, then, you know, we'd still be at episode zero. You know, yeah. it just, it, it just, it is what it is. And like I said, people are coming out of the woodwork. People are telling me, people see it. Uh, and you, and I don't know who has, you know, who's seen it and not mentioned something to me, but that will happen increasingly because I've, I've just seen it time and time again so to kind of review on our process um you know to to be fair let's just be open anybody who's watching this they're our boys you know our girl you know they're they're their home team they know us yeah it's not a random person yeah like or, or even if you don't now you're in you know we'll yes. be one trust um 
it works better when we have a plan sorted out ahead of time. You know, as much as we want it to feel casual, like we're just talking, it kind of sucks. You know, screen shares stuck on this, <laughs> on the podcast, because, you know, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of data, right? So unless you know exactly what it is, we can show one point, but like doing a side-by-side -side build isn't really compelling, you know, to watch. Yeah. Uh, we're good at the do part. Like, honestly, that it goes back to Billy for me, you know, just do yep. it, pick it up, make it work. And the reason I know it works is because that's how I've provided for my family for the last eight last years. Decade. Right, exactly. Yeah, right. Like it is what it is. Uh, and then that review step, in truth, we are really, you know, when it ends, we see it, you know, we'll always kind of turn the, the record off. We'll talk for a few minutes, see what else we should do to make it better and include that in the plan next week. So uh, we're always trying to evolve. Um, definitely not there yet, but like you said, Tom, I'm super excited to see where we're going to be at at episode 20. Um, and honestly, I want to get start getting some guests on. So if you are watching this and you know somebody that you think we should be talking to, somebody who's really killing it, whether it's like video, just online, or just somebody who just needs to be talked to, you know, somebody who who has something that could bring people to to the other people watching, absolutely let us know in the comments or just reach out to us. We're not hard to find. Uh, Tom, is there anything you want to touch on before oh, we uh, call I think it that, That's it, man. I think just really, uh, if, if there's one key to kind of get out of this show, uh, today's episode, it was that three step that Kevin kind of uh, left off with. It's uh, plan, do, and review, right? And you, unless you go through that cycle, you're not going to get better. And just push publish, take that action, take that jumper, do that burpee, whatever it is, right? Just get to it because that feedback loop, you are always going to grow if you're committed to it, right? That's it. Yeah, nobody cares. All right, Tom. Anyways, with that, thank you very much. We'll see you next week. Same bad chime, same bad channel. Uh, yeah. We're out. Later.